Hello there, I'm Derek Fournier and welcome to Plain Spoken, a podcast where we get real about business, leadership, and life. I've spent years in the trenches of leadership and team building, and now I'm bringing those conversations out into the open. We're going to talk strategy, dissect success, and maybe share a few laughs along the way. Each episode, I'll be joined by fascinating guests, from successful CEOs to brilliant minds shaking up their industries. We're here to offer you insights, challenge your perspectives, and ignite your curiosity. So whether you're a seasoned professional or just starting out, there's something here for you. Join me on this journey of exploration as we make sense of the complex world of business, one conversation at a time. Let's dive into today's episode of Plain Spoken. Welcome back to Plain Spoken. I'm Derek Fournier, your host, and I'm excited to be embarking on the third instance of my every two-week podcast here, Plain Spoken, where we try and bring business ideas uh, to light and then through conversation. I'm happy to announce I've got another interview lined up. I've got uh, Bo Billington coming up. We're going to talk about the freeagent.com and some interesting opportunities for fractional executives. Uh, That'll probably be coming up uh, in August at some point. But this series will continue uh, with the blog that went out this Wednesday on innovation in traditional industries. Now, I haven't spent an inordinate amount of time in traditional industries. I've I've been primarily in technology. Now, even in the beginning of my career, which was roughly uh, 452 years ago, I started at a municipality, uh, which was the electric and water facility for a city in Florida called Lakeland. Uh, we were cutting edge of technology in that we had a PC network. That was pretty high-end stuff there. PC network that was going to take over for the mainframe. And most of you probably listening to this uh, podcast are too young to even know what the hell mainframes were used for. Suffice it to say, big servers. Uh, I know that everyone out there likes to think that everything we do is so incredibly new and amazing and fascinating. But as finally I have evolved into the old bull on the hill instead of the young bull on the hill, I see the cycles of technology for what they truly are. Back then, With mainframes, everything was centralized and everything was dumb on the edge. And then we went to distributed computing because the horsepower on the nodes got better and we can distribute that and do incredible things. And that was true. And PC networks were born. And then we had the idea of consolidating those into servers somewhere else, not on premises, but like off in the ether. Oh, the cloud, right, which became essentially mainframe somewhere else. And then you had public private clouds where those servers came back on prem and you had to manage them. And the moral of the story is guess what, everybody? Half the time or better, when you think something is brand new and shiny, it's been done before, just with different tools. That said, innovation is really at the heart of all of those things. And so the conversation today is on how you can leverage innovation in your company, how I've seen innovation used, and some of the back to what I usually talk about, the basic blocking and tackling that goes into innovation uh, and how we can make sure we keep an eye on those North Stars to make sure that the innovation that we're using or that we're trying to implement can be accretive to our success, can be a net positive as we move forward with whatever the business is that we have. So for those of you who are new to the podcast, thank you for tuning in, whether you're on Spotify or YouTube. For those of you returning, thank you for coming back. And please, I, I would certainly appreciate it if you'd share this content. Uh, As I continue to grow the audience, uh, I'm going to want to get more uh, guests to call in or to to tune in. Uh, My old radio show there, calling in. Uh, But but I think that the the share of ideas is where this can become incredibly valuable. So if you hear something during this podcast, or if you read something in the blog that's that this podcast is related to that you have an opinion on, I encourage you to interact on whatever platform you saw it. Or, or get me an email, right? I'm easy to find, Derek at plainsight.net, and I'd love to have those conversations. But to kick things off, I really want to talk about uh, the, the first topic. And let me get our slides up here. Uh, well, I don't know if my editing will be good enough to clean this up, but a uh, fun fact, we just had a power outage here in Florida where it's roughly 274 degrees. And uh, we'll see how StreamYard recovers. So those of you listening uh, on Spotify or on YouTube realize that the power went out and dumped everything, but that's okay. I, I like to share that stuff. So if you're out there doing these things, you realize these, these events can happen. But as I mentioned before we went to that break, we're going to focus on customer needs first. And 
this gets lost too often. I've had conversations with people in countless entire environments where founders quite often, uh, innovators by trade or, or by proxy, uh, have the great idea, the epiphany moment where they're going to go solve this great problem. And then they run off and they start working on solving it. They build what they call a minimally, minimally viable product. And they go try and t show the world that their product, their answer is what they need. Uh, this is going to start a bit of a firestorm. And I've talked about it before. I don't know if I did on the podcast or in blogs. But in conversations with folks, you have got to focus on customer needs. Where is the pain? What is the problem you're solving? So just because you come up with a good idea, while that may be admirable and it might be fun and it might be great conversation at a bar, does not a product make. And I will caution you, if you've ever had the thought, I don't need to ask my clients or my customers, I know what they need. You need to pump the brakes hard. Whether that is coming from a source of arrogance, overconfidence, uh, who knows where it comes from, I will assure you most of the time you're wrong. Now, you may not be being rude or arrogant or any of those negative uh, descriptors, but you need to at least vet this out with the customers. Now, I haven't read the rest of this book yet. I know it's a good book my friend Jim read, which is The Mom Test. You need to make sure that the idea uh, and the innovation that we're talking about, which is really the root of this conversation, is innovation anyone really gives a shit about. And that means talking to customers or potential customers. And I have a really good case study for this. When I was working at Microsoft back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I worked on a product called Systems Management Server. It was the most hated back office product in the Microsoft stack. Everyone up to and including Bill Gates and Jim Alchin hated it, detested it, despite it producing roughly a quarter million dollars of revenue year on year, uh, even with its ineptitude and its 1.0 framework and the incredible challenges that we had when we rushed the release of the 2.0 version in preparation for the Y2K uh, shenanigans that everyone anticipated due to the two date problems that existed. If you don't know what those are, feel free to ask me. We'll talk about them. But Myself and a number of like-minded members of the team decided what we really needed to do was despite the incredible amount of effort we had taken to line out the test scenarios and build massive test labs and run tons of automation to make sure that the product we were producing would work for our customers. We had a very large customer base. Uh, you know, I, I think at the time, uh, hundreds of millions of devices, but I, I could be making that up. It's a large number, suffice it to say. No matter what our best intentions were, the normal pressures of release drove us to release a product that was not ready. And so SMS 2.0 released and was largely uh, reviled even more so than its predecessor. So we went back to the drawing board and we, we worked and we produced a build and don't quote me on the counts, over a thousand bug fixes went into SP1 or service pack one of, of SMS 2.0, an incredible team of dedicated, passionate and bright people but we knew that we still didn't get the customer validation uh, and the customer environment testing. And, and we weren't even sure we were navigating in the right direction. We knew we had done a lot of good work. We knew we had cleaned up a lot of the mess, but there were many of us once again, who thought, God, if we just had a way to check with our customers, we could make sure this was ready. We did not have the authority to do that. We did not have the facilities to do that. And so we released service pack one of, uh, of SMS. And it was much better, but it missed the mark. There were somewhere between three and five defects that we could not catch with our exhaustive test labs, massive test labs. We needed true customer data, whether it is environmental, domain configurations, et cetera. We had to get out there and get it. So we finally got the green light to create something that we called an early adopter program. At the same time, or roughly the same time in the Windows uh, product group, and this lets you know how long ago this was, because we were talking about Windows 2000, and here we sit in 2024. For you younger folks listening to the podcast, I promise you, there will come a day where you will have a conversation like this, where that, that bit will flip when you go from the young person in the room to the older person in the room, and this is it for me. Um, they were trying to build the same thing. You have beta programs where you'd airdrop these things called CDs that we used to use to load software. 
But for back office products, it was really hard because people didn't load it at home. You needed a, a massive infrastructure. And so we built a program to, to convince these enterprises that in exchange for access to the product group, advanced access to training, our ear towards the future to listen to them, to, to try and address their pain and not just make features that we thought were cool, they would allow us to deploy in production uh, under you know incredibly tightly controlled environments and monitor those deployments to make sure that the product was uh, as solid as it could be. And we were incredibly successful with Service Pack 2 of SMS. We addressed most of the issues. Now, it wasn't perfect. Listen, you don't make perfect software. That's not how it works. But that was where we started to see in our group. And other people may have had this vision before us, um, and people may have had a better, clearer version of this after us. But this is where my experience came from. We realized that while I think the quote is, uh, no one asked Edison to invent the light bulb. I'm not sure who gets the attribution on that. Um, and I know that uh, there's one that's attributed to Henry Ford, which is, you know, if, if I had built what they wanted, I would have built a faster horse. There is a difference between evolutionary innovation and revolutionary innovation. And I don't think you have to choose one or the other. I think, in fact, the recipe for success and innovation in any industry, be it traditional or otherwise, is to realize that both of them are powerful. One of them, the evolutionary part, requires incredible attention to the customer environment and the customer feedback. The other one also does. You can vet these things out before releasing them and make sure that you're actually addressing pain. And, and there are all sorts of hints and, and signposts along the road that if we had just been more uh, attentive, we would have seen, uh, you know, we've known for years, you don't sell features in software. You sell benefits. And whether it's software or hardware, that's always true. What is the benefit? And a benefit addresses a pain or provides a new opportunity or experience. And so I, I say all that to point out, it is incredibly critical to get to know your customers if they already exist and connect with them. Because when you connect with them, they care about what you're doing more because they see that you care. And I was just on a call earlier today where I, I dropped the coaching maxim, no one cares about how much you know until they know how much you care. That's true everywhere. And that's absolutely true innovation. You will buy yourself a ton of grace for the eventual screw ups you will in fact cause and the pain you will unintentionally inflict in the pursuit of innovation. If people know that you were innovating because you cared about the problems they were facing and you were trying to solve them. And I had a note on my sheet down here that I keep looking down at. Um, we had our first step was really what we called SWAT teams. We went out myself as a PM or test representative. I was sort of wore both hats and a developer. And we would address the top X pains that our largest customers had. We would hot fix on site. We would test on site. We would then reverse integrate it to the main build. We would get a build and we would move forward. That was how we went to address and stop the bleeding of the previous attempts to innovate without vision. So I know I belabor this point, but I do so because it is so critical. If you think you know better than your customers, I promise you, you don't. You know different than your customers, and that's important. And so for us to look at that sort of combination of evolutionary enhancement with revolutionary innovation, but all done on the backdrop of driving benefits and not features, uh, we will all innovate in a much more realistic way. Number two, uh, topic number two, uh, is to encourage a culture of innovation in your company. Uh, now, that can be whether you're uh, a tech company or not. And, and in fact, we'll talk a little bit later about John Deere, who has never been accused of being a tech company. But any company can innovate. And one of the ways you do that is to make sure that the folks understand that you have challenging projects. All of the things you face are, are complex, right? So how can you provide the opportunity to work on the most complex things to the people who have the most creativity? That's a way to increase retention. And, and I'm using this uh, culture of innovation as a retention issue for top talent. I've talked about before this game simulation called Tango, which simulates business. The way to attract top talent is obviously you can pay them really well. 
uh, or you can give them great things to work on. And if you're giving them great things to work on, that usually means challenging things to work on, which require innovation. And so if you can foster and, and encourage that culture that, hey, listen, if there's a better mousetrap here, let's talk about it. How do we get it going? Then you can lead right into uh, the, the next step, which we'll talk about with regards to codifying it in the form of R&D or research and development. But I, I have another example here, and I'll pull from my Microsoft bucket once again. When I was at Microsoft working on that team, uh, WMI, as you know it, for those tech people listening to this podcast, that's Windows Management Infrastructure. It wasn't always Windows Management Management Infrastructure. It actually started out as Web-Based Enterprise Management, or WebM. And in fact, I think you can still on new Windows type in WebM test and get access to the uh, test app. But that existed because everyone knows the registry sucks. Uh, the registry exists in Windows. There, I don't know what the analog is in the Mac world because I'm not allowed to. Because when you work at Microsoft, they put a chip in your head and it stops you from working with Apple. That's not true in case I need to put a disclaimer. But the team that was working needed a better registry. And so they thought, wow, we should really build a model similar to what we had seen in other industries like DMI or in, in the Intel world. Um, and, and be able to store classes with data and query it and do really efficient things with it. And a couple of smart folks went and built it. And it became codified in WebM. And I think it released first. I can't remember the first release vehicle for it, to be honest. It wasn't NT40, I don't think, but it may have been. At any rate, it became part of the operating system. Because we had a culture at Microsoft at that time. And we had some, listen, we had some toxic culture shit going on at Microsoft too. It was not all sunshine and rainbows, as our friend Rocky Balboa would say. But we absolutely had a culture of innovation. If you could come up with a better way to do something and you could show that it was demonstrably better, you would find a champion and you would be able to release it. Making sure your teams know that that is what you want. You don't ever get mad at a, a person. You get mad at a problem and you celebrate solutions. Right? I don't care where in the org it comes from. Uh, I will go on a, a bit of a tangent here as I wrap up the story on WMI and Webm. Uh, there's a book called Outstanding, and I will paraphrase this. They're having a problem with an assembly line. Uh, I think it was oil filters, which are rough, roughly small cylinders that go in boxes. And the automation that was doing the robotics, they were having a number of problems where an oil filter wouldn't get in a box. They'd have empty boxes that caused rework. It caused reduction in margin, all sorts of problems. And they brought in a top tier consulting firm to attack this problem. It was a supply chain problem. It was a, a automation problem. They had to get to the bottom of it so they can improve their bottom line. And I encourage you to read the book Outstanding to get the true case study with all of the details because I didn't bother to go get any of them before this uh, crazy tangent hit my head. But some number of weeks, maybe even months after they had approved this, I would assume significant spend uh, for a top tier consulting company, uh, the management was down uh, in the in the facility and had heard that the numbers had improved dramatically. And they were very excited. They thought, hey, look at look at us. We're smart. We brought in really smart people. We've addressed the issue. And they were told, no, they haven't even started that project. And they were like, well, what the hell? How, how have all of the numbers, the metrics gotten better? And they went down to the actual line. And what had happened was someone had just put a fan next to the end of the line so the empty boxes would be blown off and put back in so they could be filled instead of them packing boxes that were not filled. And it was just someone on the line that realized this was stupid and this would be an easy solution. Encourage that culture of innovation. That was innovative. You might think a, an oscillating fan is not innovative. Well, that usage of it sure as hell was. So back at Microsoft, it was encouraging the developers who wanted to de develop this Windows management infrastructure or at the time web-based enterprise management empowering them to go build it and then helping them as they proved out the implementation to grow it into a fully robust infrastructure that lives on now 24, 25 years later because someone got pissed off that they didn't like doing registry calls, um, which if you've ever done them, no one does. Number three would be to invest in research and development. So if you're culturing this uh, innovative environment, you also need to invest in it. And one of the ways you can do that is through uh, intellectual property in the form of uh, patents or trademarks. Now, this is a really touchy subject for me because in my previous company, uh, patents are, are a sticky wicket. 
Everyone thinks they invented everything. The moral to the story here that I'll tell you to get through the painful part is the rich person, the richer person, the more well-funded person will almost always win. And this is just true. Truth really doesn't play much of a role in here. But patents in general exist for two reasons, to protect or to be used for marketing. They don't protect you very well unless you're willing to spend an inordinate amount of money. But they can be an incredibly valuable tool to build value in your company. And we did it at Microsoft. You would uh, you had to assign your patents over to the company. That was part of the deal. But we had an incredible program to incent you to do that. And as someone who builds your company, having a patent portfolio can be very, very valuable, especially if it's paired with a, a legal department that is willing and able to defend those patents. That is, you know, uh, again, I'll use a Rocky quote again. I think this is Rocky Five. Got to put the hustle behind this muscle. So if you've built a culture where people are coming up with these incredible ideas, uh, then you enforce those ideas or you codify them with legal activity around patents or trademarks or the other appropriate legal pieces. Then you are going to encourage people to do that R&D. Um, now, R&D sometimes gets tossed aside, and it's oftentimes used as a catch-all. It's for, for playing. But sometimes we, we discover things in our play. So with that culture, you want to make sure people realize that if they go off and they come up with a better mousetrap, the company that they work for is going to make sure they support them in it. There's going to be reward for them. And if it can make things better for the company itself, that's going to move everyone forward. And that, that innovation can be enhanced and, and augmented. And it's really a lot of fun. Now, another topic here is adopt new technologies. So you've had the discussions, you've got smart people, you maybe even codified it in the form of some sort of intellectual property protection. But if people don't adopt it, it doesn't work. And so the original topic of this was innovation in traditional industries. And the case study that I called up in the blog post was John Deere. John Deere is a, a relatively famous case study of this because you think about what goes on in agriculture, who John Deere services a lot of, and you don't think about innovation. But with an incredibly uh, rapidly growing population, all of the production for uh, industrial agriculture has got to improve. They've got to be able to wrestle efficiency here and there. And so the combination of using advanced analytics, getting the data back from all of the different parts of the actual supply chain and fields, et cetera, and then being intelligent with robotics and enhanced technology have allowed John Deere to do incredible things and allow John Deere to pass those pieces of data onto their customers so they can be more efficient. So when you look at the, the cluster of events, whether it's the, the data collection through IoT, Internet of Things, right, collecting temperatures and salinity. And, and I'm not a farmer. So there's a billion other things here that are probably way more interesting even than what I'm describing. But you could certainly project that onto a more traditional industry that you're familiar with. Uh, and we talk sometimes about supermarkets. Supermarkets going to lights that only turn on in the freezer section when there's someone present. Yeah, you may only save a small amount of energy, but that small amount of energy every day in every store matters. Right. So being able to adopt new technologies and be smart about what those new technologies are allows you to stay on the leading edge of things without becoming trapped by the bleeding edge. And and, and that's that's important. Right. Because you don't want to just run to all the next new technologies. You want to vet them out and vet them out for yourself, because while a technology in and of itself is just interesting, a technology that you can use in your business to make your business better by either reducing costs or increasing your opportunity for revenue, et cetera, um, that becomes powerful. We've seen a number of times where people adopted new technology too fast, right? They were early adopters on everything, and they end up on the bleeding edge of these, these technology uh, challenges. And, and I'd love to tell you that there's a formula for this, and there's a clear-cut way to avoid being on the bleeding edge and staying on the leading edge but there isn't. The best way to do it was a, is with an incredible team who you trust. And that team goes out and vets these things out. They're always looking for the next best mousetrap. They bring it in and they test it and say, hey, it's really neat, but it's not for us. Or they say, hey, it's really neat. And we're going to try and, and sample this out in this department and build a program. But you have to be willing 
to look at the next new mousetrap. Uh, if not, you're going to wake up one day and you're going to be, you know, the the old guys in the room with no innovation, and that's not where anyone wants to be. Now, there's another example of this that's more popular, probably in social media senses. Uh, there's a, a young lady who uh, uh, Cody Sanchez, a contrarian uh, consultant, I think is her her website. I, I can't remember. I'll probably put it in the the link, but it's easy enough to find. She's very bright, former uh, finance czar, wizard, managed all sorts of cool stuff, but her current uh, jihad of sorts is to buy boring businesses. And there's an incredible amount of intelligence behind this with the number of businesses that are owned by baby boomers who are aging out and may want to sell. There are all of these sort of cottage industry businesses that are boring as she calls them and sometimes not glamorous, right? So it could be garbage collection, laundromats, window installation. My neighbor who was a high-end CIO bought a roofing company franchise, three of them in fact. And the concept here is you buy the boring business because those folks maybe do their demographic. It's not to say that some people that are older aren't smart or don't know what technology is because those things are not true. But if you have a business that hasn't leveraged technology and hasn't adopted new technology, whether it's in its actual blocking and tackling of the business or whether it's in its marketing, its customer acquisition, its communication, its scheduling, part of her magical formula, which she shares with everybody. She's an incredible presenter. If you don't follow her, uh, I encourage you to do so because it's really some exciting opportunities, especially for folks who are contemplating entrepreneurial endeavors. It's way easier to buy an existing profitable business, notable exception being how you buy it, and she talks about that, than it is to start a new business that you hope someone cares about. So, but you get that business in, you understand how it runs now. So current state, how do I keep making the amount of profit that I'm making right now when John, who I bought it from, ran it? And then how can I apply some cool or interesting or innovative tech? Maybe, like I said, on customer acquisition, on delivery of service, on scheduling, uh, on marketing, on execution to reduce my cost, which will increase my margin, or maybe even to increase my customer base at the same time. That is the fundamental or one of the core fundamentals to what she does in that, that buying boring businesses. So adopting new technologies, being willing and able to address issues of your market with technology as a tool. And the last one is collaborating with startups. And this one's kind of fun because if you're the big folk, right, if you're at a big company, and, and again, this has been an incredibly Microsoft heavy uh, podcast episode for me, but that happens. Um, we had a giant partner ecosystem, small companies. And I actually spent some time on that side of the table too with a company called Intrinsic, where large companies create these things that do really, really cool stuff. In our case, systems management server, which became system center configuration manager. But it did like these 10 things pretty well, right? Because it had to do it for everybody. There were always going to be point solutions that did individual pieces of that pie much, much better. And so partner ecosystems are an incredibly lucrative environment, whether you're building the businesses or using them. If you're if you're someone who runs Virgin Voyages right now, you probably use five to 10 really small companies to do really niche things. Now, sometimes there are really small companies that do really big things for you. That's a risk, right? Because the more involved they are, the more risk you take on with a small company. Uh, the saying used to be, no one got fired for hiring IBM. Probably not true anymore. But uh, the idea here is being you start with the big company and then you refine down to the smaller companies, right? So startups in this case are interesting because hopefully if they follow this kind of a checklist, they started with, there is an identified pain here. Maybe it was, and in, in our case with systems management server or system center, uh, the company I worked for intrinsic, it was operating system deployment. There was no good, efficient way to deploy operating systems in an automated fashion, which was ridiculous because they came out every five years. And it was a huge pain in the ass to deploy them and migrate people to the new operating system. And so there was this massive market opportunity. And the company I was with had some really smart folks and they built a great way to do it. And we went out and started to evangelize it. And we even got some customers and we talked to the mothership at Microsoft and they were very interested. And we just did a bad job of understanding our place in the partnership world. 
So Microsoft went off and did their own version, which maybe wasn't as good, but was good enough. And it was Microsoft's, so someone didn't have to trust a small company or a startup. And so we lost out in that space. So I think, I think there are people still working in it. it. It never became what it could have been. On the contrary, there are patching solutions and update solutions that bolt onto these things. Look at Salesforce. There's an entire ecosystem of startup companies that have built apps that ride atop that Salesforce platform. You can do the same thing. If you can create a platform play and then partner with startups to extend and enhance in these niche areas that you may not have the scope, then, then this becomes sort of a, a, an incredible secret sauce. Um, that also gives you agility uh, and, and the ability to take on the fearlessness of those startups. So while you and your core company may not have all of that same willingness or ability to try out new features, new functionality, go into different vertical markets, by partnering with startups who have that domain expertise, you can. It's almost like it's a growth through acquisition method, but it's not. It's a growth through partnership method. Now, those partnerships could at some point become acquisitions, uh, but all of that ties back to the root concept, which is innovation. Maybe this is the bolting on of a set of features and functions to take you into a new vertical market that's a traditional market that had not used your services before. We're seeing this a lot in AI because people are shoving AI into everything now. But if you can make the value proposition better, then that makes a lot of sense. So those are the uh, five topics today. We started with focus on customer needs, and I'd actually give it probably three or four places in this list just to make sure that people understand that. I prattled on quite a bit about it in this conversation, but I think it's very important. Encouraging a culture of innovation, making sure your folks understand how important innovation is, and you encourage it uh, in whatever methods you can, because that's going to lead to employee retention, as well as employee attraction. If people know that they can work on innovative things with you, they're going to want to come work on those innovative things with you. Then you codify it by investing in research and development, making sure that people realize this isn't a happenstance. This is part of who you are, right? Innovation matters to you. And innovation can be technical. It can be software. It can be hardware. It can be process. It can be people. It can be training. Innovation is the thought of innovating. How you codify that is the research and development piece. Adopting new technologies, realizing whether or not the better mousetrap is actually better for you, being willing to take those risks and allowing yourself the accelerant of partnering with startups and smaller companies so that you don't have to go become experts in those niche areas. You can leverage the hard things that you do, the core values that you represent, and partner with that and then determine whether or not there's a future for you in that space. On a closing action, call to action, or a closing and call to action space, um, I just did sort of a summary of all the key points. I want to make sure that you guys uh, know that we'd love to have the interaction with you, whether it's in our YouTube uh, comment section on Spotify. Uh, I don't do Twitter really anymore, but if you, I'm sorry, X, I'm supposed to call it. If you want to tweet at Derek Fournier, that's D-E-R-E-K Fournier, F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R, I certainly will engage that way. LinkedIn is the best place for us. We have our plain sight LinkedIn page, which is linked below. Um, we, uh, we are going to continue with this series, um, moving into the next uh, blog post, which I will cover here in a second. Our next series, which will be out in two weeks, is about navigating business transformation. So whether that's... Uh, the innovation like we've talked about here, or whether it's uh, by way of mergers and acquisitions, which is often a time where you have to transform things, or maybe implementation of a new ERP solution. Uh, these are things that oftentimes create serious chaos in an organization. And there are some methods and approaches that you can take to lessen the risk, reduce the impact, and lead to higher standards of those transformations, whatever they happen to be. The, the core technology approaches are largely the same. Uh, and it's one of those places where uh, an ounce of prevention beats a pound of cure. Um, and that is quite often the case. So uh, I do want to thank you guys for joining this uh, episode of Plain Spoken. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Hopefully you're enjoying this new format. If you're one of our uh, listeners, viewers, whatever you want to call it, interactors, uh, who actually watch us on YouTube. We're trying out a new camera. If you haven't checked us out on YouTube, please do. 
go over there. Uh, trying to improve the production quality. I'm doing this on my own here in my home studio, my which is my home office for anyone scoring this at home. Um, but I'm using my camera as a, as a, or my, sorry, my old phone as a camera. And I think that the quality may be better this time. So again, here's how you interact with us on LinkedIn. Look for Plain Sight Strategy Group. We post a tremendous amount of content. Go to our website as a heart, plain, P-L-A-I-N dash site, S-I-G-H-T dot net. Engage with our blogs out there. It's not just me. Bob Eck, who just recently joined us, Bob Eck Agevli, um, tremendous technology background. Uh, man, Jim Learish on his operation side, uh, doing great things out there, has participated. And of course, uh, Joe Carino, our finance czar. He's yet to bless us with content, but I suspect he will once he stops traveling the world. Um, so I will see you on LinkedIn. Love to get feedback from you, but thanks for joining this episode. Thanks so much for tuning into another episode of Plain Spoken. I hope today's conversation sparked some new ideas and left you with a few takeaways to ponder or implement in your own journey. If you enjoyed the show and found value in our dialogue, I'd be really grateful if you could hit the subscribe button. Sharing this podcast with your network helps us grow and continue to bring you insightful and engaging content. Don't forget, you can find us on LinkedIn and a few other social platforms. Follow us, interact with our posts, and join the Plain Spoken community. Your thoughts, feedback, and ideas are what keep this conversation going. So please drop us a line or leave us a comment. Thanks again for joining me, Derek Fournier, on Plain Spoken. Keep an eye out for our next episode. And until then, keep growing. What the, what the, what the, what the, what the.